There's probably still people filing in, but I want to get started so I don't run too late. I have a lot of material to cover too. Uh, thanks a lot for that last presentation. It's going to be a perfect segue into what I'm talking about because this is talking about more of adding a subtarget. So assuming you've got a backend already in a, for a particular target, this is adding a subtarget and then optimizing it specifically for scheduling. Um, I'm really excited to see all the turnout too. Uh, the presentation I think turned out well considering I did on the flight on the way over here. But no, I didn't. I did, but I did write the code. So we'll see when the code comes up how well it works. Uh, speaking of the code. Um, I've got a few patches sitting on Code Aurora form. Uh, people have an AR64 backend built and they want to go along. Um, I'll be typing kind of fast, uh, just applying patches really and just showing kind of how to use uh, table gen, uh, how to actually evaluate your scheduling and stuff like that. But you can pull those patches from there. Uh, apply the first one or two uh, and then I'm going to go through the uh, presentation a little bit about that. And uh, the third one, don't look at yet because it's a bug fix. They actually fixed on the flight. It's like perfect. All right, I'll start with a quick scheduling overview. So when I say scheduling, I mean either static instruction scheduling or dynamic. So typically static instruction scheduling is just ordering instructions in the instruction stream so as to avoid stalls, bubbles, uh, and increase IPC. Um, it's really critical for, for machines like a uh, VLI, VLIW architecture. Uh, but it's actually really important for a, a, an in-order standard machine or even an out-of-order machine. Um, I did a couple of uh, um, uh, models, you know, scheduling information for the A53, an in-order machine, and the A57. The A53 returned about a 4% geo mean gain over these benchmarks we're looking at. Um, and then I thought that, you know, the A57 was going to be a wash, but I figured I need to do it anyway. And it was closer to 10%. I was absolutely floored. Uh, after analyzing, you know, the ISA a little bit more, we started to realize why. And I'll touch on that just a little bit. So, of course, dynamic instruction scheduling is what you get on a device that's out of order. Um, but it's critical if it's going to make any good decisions about how to pick instructions that you give it plenty of instructions to choose from. So if you've got a machine that's a, a, a bound on dispatch decode, um, then you know, it might not have much to issue or to choose. So a quick history of LVM schedulers. Um, I did a little bit of a Git archaeology. Uh, when I was learning all this and see how it evolved. But before 2008, uh, instruction scheduling happened at the end of uh, uh, selection DAG. So at uh, the end of uh, instruction scheduling. So at the end of the pass, the selection DAG uh, was transformed into scheduled DAG. And then the scheduled DAG nodes, or SD nodes, were then scheduled. Those are the units, the scheduling units. Um, there's two, so over here on the right, that's kind of a class hierarchy, so to speak. You've got your scheduled DAG, and then they had two, hi or two versions of it, uh, register reduction uh, one, and then a, a fast. Then it got really interesting when they wanted to add um, post-RA scheduling, because after register allocation, you don't have a selection DAG anymore. So it was extended scheduled DAG into scheduled DAG SD nodes for the traditional SD node scheduler, uh, and then scheduled DAG insters, which works on machine insters. Uh, and then they have a new scheduled post RA top down list scheduler. It works in those machine instars. And that runs in its own pass. So, of course, it's not attached to the instruction selection pass, it's its own standalone pass. Uh, then things got really interesting again uh, in 2012. Um, folks that might have seen um, the, uh, the Lauren and Trick uh, presentation on the machine scheduler, this is when the machine scheduler got rolled out. And the machine scheduler is kind of like the new scheduling solution that's really actually has a lot of legs um, and especially as far as simplicity of specifying all your scheduling information uh, and the flexibility of its use. So in 2012 the machine scheduler came out. Um, it works the machine insters so it uh, scheduled DAG MI was derived or extended from the scheduled DAG insters class uh, and then there's a, a one that tracks live ranges and then the specific one for VLIW. Uh, and then 2014 uh, Andy was nice enough to go ahead and add in support for post RA. Because we were working on the AR64 backend and we didn't want to do any of the old legacy instruction itineraries to support the old legacy schedulers. Um, so we wanted to use the machine scheduler and it was just in time, right when I was ready for it, bam, it's like, oh yeah, I committed that a couple weeks ago. So now we can run post RA and again using the same machine scheduler and the same scheduling information. Now I'll go in a little bit more detail on the MI scheduler or machine scheduler, two terms are kind of interchangeable. So the machine scheduler is, like I said, slowly being adopted as the schedule of the future. Um, for instance, for the AR64 backend, uh, it's the only schedule we've got. We haven't done any scheduling information uh, for the old legacy schedulers. 
Um, it's a list scheduler, again, suitable for VLIW or in, in order or out order machines, you name it. It's really super flexible. Uh, supports a couple schemes, top down, bottom up, or you can have a converging one where it actually picks the best of both as it's going. Uh, and actually tracks several heuristics. So a lot of the old heuristics that the old schedule we're using uh, has been uh, adopted going forward and it, more and more are being added. Um, it's pretty easy to use. So right there from LLC, if you want to enable it, you can just use the enable my sketch flag to turn it on uh, and to turn on the post RA pass too. It's just my sketch post RA. Um, optionally, if it's a little bit more permanent for your, sub, or for your target, or for your sub-target, I should say, you can override your target sub-target info, um, the uh, enable machine scheduler implementation, the enable post machine scheduler implementation. Um, beside that, you can force a particular scheme. So if you're actually, I did this a lot when I was uh, evaluating my models once I started building them. Um, I was wondering, okay, is this going to work better, the converging, or top down, or bottom up? I was trying any flag I could to see what kind of results I was getting. Uh, and you can do force a scheme with top down or bottom up there. Um, and you can go ahead and turn on additional heuristics or analysis as well with those flags. So these are all things you want to keep in mind uh, when you're uh, developing your, your model for your sub-target so you can evaluate how well it's working. Um, you can also specify a, a strategy, and I'll talk a little bit more about strategies, um, but these are basically uh, adjustments to the algorithm. The algorithm will work the same generically. Uh, you just specify whatever scheduling information you need. But if you need something a little bit more specific for your sub-target, that flexibility is there too. Um, so speaking of flexibility, the MI scheduler is really highly flexible on how you want to use it. Uh, you're going to find you're not really going to do any of this, but it's all there and it's all documented pretty well uh, in the code uh, if you want to see machine scheduler.h there. Um, so like I said before, it's basically a pass. So it's a machine function pass. Uh, machine scheduler uh, pass goes ahead and calls schedule region which then picks the uh, particular um, scheduler itself. Um, so schedule DAG runs do, 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 implementation and then uses try candidate. Schedule will use try candidate uh, as another implementation in your strategy that just tries those different candidates and figures out what's most appropriate for those heuristics. Um, so what you can do is you can replace the entire pass if you wanted to. Uh, or you can actually just override that DAG builder and scheduler. So like they've done there with schedule DAG MI live. Or you can just implement your own new strategy. So over here, we've got the machine strategy, the basic one, generic scheduler base, and then generic scheduler is what's used for ARCH64. It's kind of like the generic scheduler. Uh, and it's slightly tweaked for post RA. So then it's extended in post RA, or the post generic scheduler. Uh, R600's got their own, so you could definitely add in your own strategy if you need to. But what you're going to find is you're going to get enough bang for your buck just defining a good sketch machine model. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more in this section. So this is the fun part. I'm so glad. I feel like this uh, uh, LLVM conference this year is all about table gen. It was the bad guy last year, and now it's the good guy winning over everybody. But uh, it's actually not really too bad to use. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of details, a little bit more detail, because I have more time because I'm covering less, and specifically all the, uh, the classes and whatnot that you'll be using for your sketch machine model. Um, again, read the manual uh, to familiarize yourself with TableGen, because lots of the documentation for the generators themselves and the actual classes, like I said, um, are all in the code, but you've got to be able to read TableGen definitions to kind of get used to what they're doing. Uh, so get familiar with that. It's really, really going to help. So table gen, uh, lots, of the, um, lots of the aspects of your particular sub-target uh, and the target itself, as you've seen, is uh, used in table gen. Um, so for ARCH64, the main file down below is the main uh, target definition for the ARCH64 backend. Uh, but like they were showing you before, all your calling conventions, your instruction formats and info, um, register info, all that is actually uh, in table gen as well. Now, some bigger hitters in here, you see there's a lot more of these sketch files. So that's because Cyclone is a particular sub-target. Uh, A57 and A53 are all the existing sub-targets for ARCH64 today. Um, and that's where you go in and start refining things for the sketch machine model that I'm talking. Um, so these table gen backends that I talked about before, these, these generators, these are the popular generators you're going to be looking at uh, as you're developing your sub-target. Print records, actually that's the default. If you just run table gen on ARCH64, that's what's going to happen. It's going to spit out all the records. 
Um, it's really valuable for making sure that the instructions that you're trying to provide scheduling information for have their correct values in there. So I have a couple little scripts and stuff I use to make it a little easier to parse through this. Um, I'll show you an example of one a little bit later if I get a chance. Um, but in particular, what we're really interested in most is the subtarget info. So when you run gen subtarget. Oops. So this is an overview of what they talked about before too. Um, so this individual information on a TD file, this is a small snippet, gets run through a table gen generator, in this case the subtarget generator, gets put into a, a dot .inc file, and those get included. So you can see the exact, that's the exact uh, C code that shows up, or a C++ that shows up in the dot .inc file. Um, and then that gets included in a few places. Now, this dot .inc file is your entire subtarget info, and it's got lots of different sections in it. And those sections are delineated with uh, pound defines. So you'll turn on a section if you need it with a particular pound define. So that's what you see here in uh, MC target description. Uh, define it and then include it. And it just puts in, basically includes the piece you needed for that MC target description. Um, just a couple quick basics that might help us, you know, read the manual of course. But a couple quick basics that'll help us when we're going through some of these examples. Um, everything in TableGen is basically a record. Uh, record is just a, a name, a list of values, and a list of superclasses, because it's very, very hierarchical. Um, a def is a concrete form, so an instantiation of a particular class. Um, and then multi-classes is basically just multiple inheritance. So you can actually have a def that defines several uh, abstract classes. Um, there's a few things, too. You're not going to use too many fancy things uh, other than strings and whatnot, but there's uh, a table gen. There's uh, support for loops, uh, control flow. It uh, can be very programmatic. Um, so when you delve into building your sketch machine model for your subtarget, uh, spend a lot of time. I can't emphasize this enough. Well, I guess I can. Read target schedule.td. Uh, all the comments in there are really good. They're really cryptic um, sometimes because you're not going to understand the, the language that's used throughout. There's another set of good uh, comments in mcschedule.h. Um, they're mostly up to date. Uh, they're really helpful. They're mostly written from the perspective of an out-of-order machine because the machine scheduler was kind of written for out-of-order and uh, adopted later for in-order targets. But it does support in-order targets well, as I'm going to demonstrate on the, the demonstration code I've got now. Um, but if you look in there, you're going to see like this particular, this is uh, the class defin or the class for, uh, so abstract class for sketch machine model, the main entry point. Uh, and there's going to be all the defaults in there for all the different fields uh, and good comments. So go ahead and read those, become familiar with them. Um, and then your first step is to actually def this in your own file. So I'll talk a little bit more about strategy later. Uh, I'll lay it out in good detail. But the first thing you want to do is every subtarget has to define a sketch machine model for their subtarget. So all these examples here are going to be from A53, straight out of the, um, the, the tip today. Um, but then my demo code is just a fictitious machine I'll show you later. So here we've defed uh, something, we've named it. So we've got a name there, Cortex A53 model. You don't necessarily need to name it though if you don't plan on reusing it later. Uh, and then it is, defines the sketch machine model and then these let statements allow you to provide different default values other than the ones that were already specified in the class. So microop buffer size is zero because this is an in-order machine. Uh, it's an issue width of two, um, so dual issue. You can do some fancy stuff to, if you have uh, issue width restrictions, but I haven't done anything like that for A53. Um, min latency, load latency, uh, mispredict penalties, these are more generic overarching settings. Um, that if you only implemented this, it kind of gets you t so far to a certain degree. You know, you at least know how wide you can issue. You don't have no idea what pipelines you're issuing into. So that's why the next step that you really want to do for your basic first implementation is to provide all the processor resources. So this is very generic. If you've got a, a really sophisticated superscalar machine, um, you could have your, all your ALUs sitting there. Um, you could have uh, uh, other resources, other functional units. You could specify how an instruction gets broken out to those micro ops and how those micro ops get sequenced together using these functional units to produce results. Um, reorder buffers at the end, you name it. But for this is, example, is really straightforward. Um, it's an in-order machine, so these are actually just pipes. 
So there's two ALUs. Uh, there's a MAC pipe, so all your ALU instructions go down there. All your uh, multiply or multiply and accumulate integer instructions go down the MAC. Uh, integer division, uh, load store for all instructions, branches, and then floating point ALU, and then like a, a, a master or a, a miscellaneous floating point for um, you know things like multiply, divide, square root, uh, as well as neon instructions. All the SIMD instructions go down those pipes. Um, that doesn't really get you far yet because now you actually have to, to associate these, these resources with all these instructions. And that's where all the sketch read writes come in. Now, I'm gonna spend a little extra time on here because it's kind of mildly confusing, but not if you think about the fact that this machine scheduler is called, often called the per operand scheduler. Uh, everything focuses on instructions operands. So every operand has got a sketch read write type. That's just the name of a superclass. And if you think about table gen being very hierarchical, uh, every so sketch read write is like the, the top level here for an operand. Now an operand might be an input or an output. So a sketch read is an input operand, a sketch write is an output operand. Um, each instruction's output operands must be annotated with a sketch write type. Um, you're going to find out in the AR64 backend, for instance, that they're not. And that's when you really want to go in and find out what all your default uh, annotations for all the instructions are. Um, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, when you're defining your instruction set, this is all in the uh, instruction info file or instruction formats in our case, the TD files. Um, there's going to be something in there that's called a sketch RW. It's a list. And the sketch RW has got a list of all the sketch read writes for those operands. So the first thing in there should always be the output operand. If there's multiple, then multiple output operands. And then you'll have optional input operands after that. Um, input operands aren't as critical, and I'll explain a little bit later. Um, so uh, yeah, some instruction operands, or some uh, input operands are annotated, some aren't. Um, so given that all these instructions have these default uh, sketch reads and sketch writes annotated on the operand. What you need to do next, uh, and this is the last critical part to get a basic model working, uh, is you need to map. You need to specify, first off, what's the latency for each one of these instructions and what processor resources does it need? So you do that with a, a, a write res. So let's make sure I get this right again here. So you have to define you can use the, you can define a sketch write res that maps resources to this individual sketch write. It kind of makes sense the naming convention after you've been using it long enough. Um, so what we've got here is a few examples. Uh, if you just see for the ARH64 backend, but other backends are pretty similar. Uh, if you just see a generic write uh, IM, uh, immediate or, or write int or, or, or integer, write integer shifted register, extended register, um, these are your generic sketch read write types. So what that's saying is that you are going to use this write res class, and this is a parameterized class. So the angle brackets mean parameterized. This is going to be, you're going to def uh, this class, which produces this mapping for you. Um, and you're basically saying that all the instructions that you have an output operand that have write immediate um, will be using this list of process resources. And there's only one in there, so they only go down that pipe. This is a really simple machine. Um, it doesn't get broken into any micro ops. It's not, it needs to split something up and go down four or five pipes. Uh, and then you're overriding the latency, which is always usually one with a latency of three. Um, so that's really all you need because at this point, the machine scheduler, uh, the per operand scheduler, can look at an instruction and say, oh, okay, well, this instruction needs to be, these are my candidates, uh, and I, that could go ahead and schedule. Um, I need to get this instruction scheduled early because it's output operand goes to this other instruction over here, and I know that it's going to take three cycles to produce it, and it's going to use this particular resource. So it just checks to see if it's scheduled anything for that cycle for that resource. It hasn't. The resource is uh, uh, not under contention. It goes ahead and schedules it, and it knows that that instruction is dependent on it, and go ahead and schedule three cycles later. Now, uh, in a simple in-order machine, chances are these pipes have a lot of forwarding built into them. So if you've got something going down an ALU pipe, sure, it might not write back to the register file until three cycles later. But it might be available for forwarding after two cycles. Now, that's where these read advances come in. Now, for a basic model, I do not recommend modeling any forwarding because you kind of don't need it. Um, you can kind of get by without it. 
Uh, I did for the A53 for a little while, and then I went ahead and added it in. And it did help refine the model and did improve things. But to get things off the ground, you don't need it. But what it basically means, and, and this is the basic model, so I've provided no forwarding information. But the way you provide that forwarding information is by using these read advances. So again, this is a definition of a class called read advance that's parameterized. And it's saying that anything uh, that is annotated with a read uh, I uh, has zero latency information, or zero forwarding. So it cannot be forward. Do not subtract any cycles from the overall latency for that write. Um, it's not actually going to be forwarded at all. Now, I'm going to delve into that a little bit deeper, because if you actually want to provide forwarding information, it's a little bit more complicated, but I'll get to that in a few slides later after we cover, finish covering our basic model. Um, so there we have it. This is the, the basic strategy. I say create your basic model, um, which defines your sketch machine model, uh, define all your processor resources, and then map to all those uh, default, or provide mappings to resources for all those default sketch write types. Then we go in and do things like uh, improve the instruction scheduling information. So sometimes those default annotations aren't very good, and I'll show you a good example of that here in a little bit. Add in forwarding, add in any kind of hazards, like if you've got instructions that go down a particular pipe, install and spin for 15 cycles while it computes you know, some kind of double precision square, uh, square root or something. Um, and then you can model some key features of your microarchitecture. But this is actually ranked, in my opinion, uh, from doing the two models that I've done. But the ranked, in my opinion, of how you want to attack things. It, it definitely diminishing returns once you start getting down here. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and do a little uh, demo of the basic model. I, I coded up a, an example architecture um, that looks a little like this. So we've got another in-order machine, uh, three cycles fetch and decode, uh, one cycle for issuing, and then not to scale, but most of those pipes take three cycles. Uh, nothing can finish, it all issues in order and uh, finishes out of order. So if something goes down, you know, one of these pipes down there, it stalls everything else. But so these are your representative latencies. You've got two of the ALUs, two of those massive uh, integer mole mine max, blah, 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 blah. Um, you don't really need to care, or you don't really need to concern yourself as far as modeling about anything up here. Um, you, in other words, sure, instruction might take a total of three, one, blah, 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 instruct, or cycles to finish fetching, decode, issuing, execute, and write back. Um, but really, all you care about is after issue. The only thing you do care about up here, pay attention to your ISA documentation, is you want to know your fetch and decode bandwidth versus your, uh, or versus your, your fetch and decode bandwidth versus your issue bandwidth. Um, remember how there's that issue width in your schedule machine model? That's the lesser of the two. So let's say you've got like a, a six wide issue machine, but typically you're only fetching and decoding three micro ops at a time. Just use three for that. All righty. So I'm going to demonstrate this list here. And again, if you guys are playing along at home, you could download that, but it's not really that exciting. All right, I'm going to try to mirror this real quick so I can actually type. And unfortunately, I didn't realize the display was going to be so small, but arrangement. Wow. I made it bigger. That's. That's weird, I don't know what just happened. Okay, we'll see. Okay, geez, everyone can read that. Let me see if I can change this resolution real quick. Sorry. Okay. So this is basically the main ARCH64 TD file. Uh, all you really need to do to add in your particular sub-target, even if you have no, let's say you just wanted to add in your, your flag, your dash MCPU flag, and you don't really have any scheduling information yet, um, all, you can, all you really want to do is just add in you know, basically your, 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 your name, 
say, no sketch model versus one of these other named sketch model definitions, machine sketch model. Um, but I want to show you one that's a little bit more fleshed out. So now uh, I've got one in there. It's called demo model. And you define this in your own sketch TD file. And I've got one that's kind of compact with not a lot of comments. Luckily, in the actual code, uh, I, I tend to comment this a lot better, and so are the other models. So when you're researching how you want to model your particular subtarget, and you're looking at these other ones, hopefully they've got some good comments. But um, similar to before, uh, inline uh, machine, so micro buff size is zero, issue width is three. Um, blah, 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 not too interesting. Um, you can set this mispredict penalty. You don't have to exactly say what the mispredict penalty is. You can kind of use it as a, a fuzzy number uh, to help guide things later. But here's my processor resources. So two of the LUs, two of these MAC divs, blah, 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 blah. Um, and now I've got this mapping here. So what you do is then you say let sketch model equal demo model in here because each of these, um, these are write reses that you're defining, but they produce a, a sketch write res uh, um, class. Um, and one of their values in there is called a sketch model. So what you're basically saying is you need to set that because as you do all these mappings, you want to say, by the way, for this sketch model of demo model, this write immediate is mapped to this demo unit ALU. Um, I've also done something a little convenient here, too. Um, so I've used a let, uh, latency equals three, because all those uh, have latency of equal to three. So this is really, really basic. Um, basic, bare minimum, all you really need to get to this done. Uh, oh, here we've got the big kicker, right? Division takes 15 cycles, so try not to divide anything, floating point division. Uh, and I've got no forwarding for any of the reads, so you need to make sure you provide forwarding information for all these read operands, um, just like you need to make sure you provide default mappings for all your uh, sketch writes, otherwise you'll run into problems later. Uh, one thing I think I included up here is this, for my sketch machine model, it has something called a complete model. Uh, set that to zero while you're doing your development, because it will cause you fewer crashes and problems if you don't have all your scheduling information defined. Um, go ahead and set it back to one once you think you're complete. And I, before you do that, I'll show you some other techniques in a second to make sure you've absolutely provided scheduling information for all of these sketch writes. Because if you haven't, the errors you get later during scheduling, it might be on some obscure instruction you never use or it never comes up very often, and then guys are calling you like, oh, there's a bug in the scheduler. So, and that's your fault. <laughs> so, I think I've built that recently, which is good because it can take some time. I'll show you, uh, kind of some of the techniques for evaluating this stuff. So, one thing you want to do is just look at all the records sometimes. So I know this is going to be tough to, and I provide this in the notes and the slides too, but just what I'm typing now is running table gen and you got to provide an include path because arch64.td includes target.td and you got to show it where that's at to find it. And then just print all the records and redirect that to records log. Um, and it's really, really tough to read. I mean, this is complete, full stuff. So what I usually use this for is double checking things. Like I said, it's not something you want to read and verify that you've got scheduling information for your instructions. But you can actually print this out and go back to it later to find out you know, what, the default sketch, what the default annotations were for these instructions. Um, but it's not really that helpful right now. What's a little bit more helpful is the subtarget stuff. So, uh, subtarget. Oh, okay. So this is okay. Let me show you what I've done here. What I've done is. You can subtarget, when you run the subtarget generator, it produces an INC file. Um, but for debugging purposes, what I really like to do is run, uh, you can barely see it, but it's this debug only subtarget dash emitter. 
This is really, really, really helpful because what you can do there is you get all this good debug information um, about all the different types I've defined for A57, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, but what I do is I like to run this through like a little script that I wrote. That just spits out CSV. So this was super, super helpful for me. I ended up having to hand review a lot of this stuff in a spreadsheet just to make sure I got all of my instructions uh, annotated correctly. But up to the top, you can barely see. It's the instruction, um, what its default sketch RW list is, and then if uh, Cyclone, uh, A53, A57, or this new demo processor, if any of these sub-targets actually provide any refined scheduling information for it. And I'll let you know a little bit more about what that is in a second. But um, see, like the first one here, Cyclone defines something called a CY write V3, and these others just use the defaults. So I'll get back to this in a second because it's going to help me debug a problem that I swear I didn't put in here on purpose, but it was kind of fun. Um, so you can evaluate this right away uh, using LLC. Specify your, uh, your triple, of course, and then your uh, CPU. So this is demo. This is a new sub-target I have added to ARCH64.TD. So you can go ahead and run it on like a little test that I've got here. Uh, and I turn on uh, often the... Um, the, the MI sketch debug output because, and then verify MI sketch. These flags together provide some really good information about exactly what's happening during the scheduling. Um, the output there is going to be in MI sketch.s. So this is the result. Um, it was a really simple test. I could show you the lit test, but it's really simple. It just has got a bunch of uh, vector ads and then division at the end, and then an add to get the results, and just returns it. Now, this is what my little bug was I thought was kind of neat. Um, you notice that that division was at the bottom, um, and I said that divisions have 15 cycles, and I didn't give you enough time to check, but there was no dependencies there. It should have been scheduled much higher, but it wasn't. And I was like, why? And it was, you know, it's on a flight at like 8 o'clock in the morning. So this is the debug output. This is the first step you do, and this is going to be really helpful as soon as someone says, hey, Dave, uh, I'm looking at this hot loop and this benchmark, and it stinks, and we think we figured out why. It's because your schedule's bad. And why is your schedule bad? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't schedule it. They might schedule or scheduled it. Um, so you need to understand why it made all of its decisions, and that's based on all the heuristics that it's using. So there's only one basic block. So this first guy, this is the basic block before um, you see all the ads in there. You see the div. Um, you see it's doing between uh, red 0 and 1, which are deft uh, way up at the top using these copies. Um, and it should have been scheduled way, way higher, but it wasn't. Uh, and I couldn't figure out why. So that's just the input. Um, all the way down here towards the bottom, I see the final schedule or still. I was like, oh, what's going on here? It's killing me. So. Let me see if I can pace with this thing. Ah. OK, so I quit. Ah, sorry. Usually I have a mouse. So I tried to look for all the whenever it was scheduled. Um, so this is, I'm scrolling up a little bit, because you see all these SUs? It's going to be helpful once you, I'm serious, if you do a lot of this, you're going to really need to look through this stuff heavily. But um, once it starts the scheduling here, these are, lists out the details about all the scheduling units, SU0, 1, da, 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 da. Um, so these are the first few. This is interesting to note. These are the these pseudo uh, ops, uh, copy, um, latency of zero. So I guess that's assuming I've got zero latency copy on this machine, but I definitely have not modeled that. So that's the first thing it tells me. i got something weird going on. Uh, I don't have any latency information for this copy instruction, or pseudo op. Um, then get down a little lower where I was before. You see ads here, for instance, latency of five. That's exactly what I expected, because I said that everything goes down the floating point ALU pipe, including vector instructions, at a latency of five. Um, then I came down here to the one I was interested in, which was the div, and I saw a latency of five. 
So it thinks a division uh, has got the exact same latency. And I was like, well, why? I did the mapping correctly. This is killing me. I was pretty jet lagged already, I guess. So what I did was um, figured out, you know, using this little script that I had over there before, what the actual, um, no, not this. Ah, there we go. So I saw that the default sketch read w list for this instruction is write v. And this is something that you're going to find in the AR64 backend. All the vector instructions have one generic sketch write type, and that's called write v, vector. But anyone who's done anything in SIMD in AR64 or, A or ARM or anything realizes that they are very, very highly uh, uh, varied uh, latencies. So it's just not enough. This write v is not enough. And you see every other, while well, Cyclone didn't, because I guess for them it mapped out perfectly, but they do a lot of these other write v's. They'll say, oh, no, that's a, C, that's a psi write v3. Uh, whereas on the A53, it didn't override it. A57 overrode it. And here you are way over there on the end, my demo, none. So basically that means that whatever I defined for that mapping for write v, the five cycles was bad. And then find out where I did it. Bad, bad, no, write v, bad, 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 bad. Yeah, here we go. I just said, hey, it goes down this, and I, the latency up here is 5. So that's when your basic model only gets you so far, and you really need to start refining things. Um, so what I did next is quit, um, get log, demo, my last patch here. Okay, so what I then did was these last two lines down here. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but this kind of fixed up the few things I was seeing. Um, this is called an instar w. Instar w is the, the primary means by which you refine the scheduling information for these uh, instructions. Um, so what it's saying is that for, again, you're defing a, a parameterized class and you provide a list in here. So you're saying that um, for these instructions, specifically, notice this is instars versus inst regex. For these instructions listed after here, it's a comma separated list. Um, they don't have a default annotation for them, or the default annotation's bad, so you're going to use this right i instead. Um, and this is a list because that default annotation could have been one or two uh, sketch writes followed by the input operands and sketch reads. So you could overwrite, overwrite all those. Um, you know, that's going to become pretty uh, uh, tedious, so that's when regex comes in really nicely. All I did was I said, hey, every instruction mnemonic that starts with fdiv, um, if I've got a match, then they all, I don't care what they were going down, if it was accidentally going down a write v or, you know, it was annotated with write v, I don't care, I want write fdiv. Uh, and I'm not going to waste your time and, and, and recompile this because I'm running on a virtual machine, it's slow. But I didn't rebuilt it, and sure enough, it promoted that load. I read that, um, that division way, way, way higher. So I'm going to slip back out out of. This, ba, 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 ba. and continue on with the presentation. So I'll cover in a little bit more detail. So I've just demonstrated, you know, how to basically edit your AR64 TD file to add your subtarget, um, how to find your new um, TD file with your sketch machine model, uh, how to add, define your processor resources, do that default mapping, um, just set the reads advances to zero, build it. And then kind of things I do, compiling debug tests or, you know, how to debug a bad schedule, things like that. Um, and that lit test that I showed is actually a pretty convenient way of writing. It's really hard to write lit tests for the scheduler. Um, you should definitely, I recommend writing a few, you know, like a half dozen, not that I've written that many, never mind. But um, it's, it's a black art, you know, and it's not like there's ever, what you can do is if you ever want to implement a particular feature like forwarding and you want to make sure forwarding is working correctly, you can come up with a, a test case. Um, but again, sometimes it's hard to write a good lit test that works all the time because who knows, some other path upstream could change things around on you. 
Um, now I'm going to go over some of the more refined uh, refinements you can make, but I am not probably going to have enough time to go into too many details. Um, like I won't do a demo or anything like that. Um, but this will save a good time at the end for questions. Um, I mentioned instar w. So your next step in refining your basic model is to definitely get all the latency information correct. Um, because you know garbage in, garbage out. Uh, in, in general, I definitely highly recommend that you do this work for your new subtarget before you start doing any optimizations on it because heaven forbid if someone spends all this time writing a pass that you know, produces this, fixes this people optimization for this one idiom that comes through and kind of find out the scheduler masks all the benefits from it by producing a horrible schedule. So definitely do your, uh, um, for your new subtarget, do the basic model first and then as soon as you can start refining all these um, uh, uh, latency. So like I've shown you before, you do this with an instar w. Um, that was the example for copy. Um, then you can also come up with these names too if you want to reuse them later. So one trick that um, uh, I did, and I actually had help from another guy that did all this, it was awesome. He went ahead and took the spec from uh, the A57 and said, well, here's all the combinations, all the outputs of microops. Like all these instructions get broken into one of these combinations of microops and latencies. And he produced uh, automatically from their table um, all of these for me. And then we, it was just up to me to go through and, and, and tag those with particular instructions using instar w's. So what this is saying here, remember how I was using write res before? Um, it actually produced a sketch write res. What I'm doing here is this is actually, uh, it, notice it's, I'm not actually doing the mapping to processor resources. I mean, I'm doing the ma mapping to processor resources, but I'm not providing a, um, uh, a default um, sketch write type that it maps to. I'm creating a brand new one uh, with the latency and resource cycles over there, which I'll tell you what that is in a second. Um, so then I can reuse that later. So then down here, these are the two examples used below. Uh, I've got some instar w's and for all these, and this is why Neon is so uh, awesome, um, there's all these weird crazy mnemonics that have to do with the, uh, the, the number of lanes, the, the, the width of every lane, stuff like that. Um, the operation, if it's actually uh, sparsely filling them or whatever. Um, so. That's where the regex gets kind of hard to read and you don't really want to review that. That's when, when I produced all this, I would go through and put it into a spreadsheet that could put pivot tables and sort things around and help that out. Uh, it'd be nice if you could get your uh, microarchitects to go ahead and spit out this stuff for you when they define all their latency stuff and I'm working on them, we'll see. He's still using Visual Basic to produce this stuff. Um, well, heaven forbid table gen, that would just kill him. <laughs> And here's a couple other examples too. Uh, yeah, so this is another interesting example, see. This is saying these instructions actually have, because they're post increments, they actually have a write address output operand as well. So A53, I'm saying the main output, uh, I'm overwriting that for these and I'm keeping the old one at the default write address, which has a latency already specified that is just perfect. Um, one thing to note, I kind of snuck it in here. There's this thing called resource cycles over there. Uh, you see it's inside brackets again. Brackets mean lists like I've shown you. Resource cycles uh, allow you to specify hazards. So when I specified these resources earlier, I gave a buffer size of zero. And there's a comment in target schedule.td, everyone's read it by now I'm sure, that says um, if you set that to zero that it's in order and it can uh, issue one every cycle or actually one every resource cycles. So resource cycles is a default that's always set to one. But what I've said here is that there's this resource cycles and it's a list and the list matches this list up here. What I'm saying is that there's a stall in there for this particular instruction. Um, in other words, I can't issue one every cycle onto this, or one of these instructions every cycle, nor can I issue something after it. It's going to basically hog that resource for two cycles before I can then issue something behind it and it goes along. So this is how you model your hazards if you have any built-in bubbles within a pipeline. Um, all right, that was a lot on that slide. Hope everyone can see that from the back. And then you can download it later. All right, and this is the really fun part. So after you've done all that, 
you can seriously consider your day gone. Uh, not day gone, your day done. You, you don't really need to do much more. But if you've got a machine like the A53 that's in order and lives and die by forwarding, because every basic, most every instruction has got a latency of four for the A53, then you really have to model forwarding so that you understand uh, exactly, because then otherwise it'll have no idea which instruction to pick for the most part, even though this can go back to back to back because it can be forwarded, for instance. So the way you do this is with read advances. Now, this doesn't say sketch read or like the other was sketch write res. Remember, I used write res. This is read advance. Now, this means that it will be a doing a mapping. So every time it sees this read i, it's going to do a mapping not of two, not a mapping, but a definition of forwarding information. Not of zero, but of two this time. So what this is basically saying is that any operand, any input operand that's got a read i can uh, be available if, if that, and if that operand is coming from a particular uh, 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 write, it knows which write it's coming from, um, that write's got a latency of four. No, this is two cycles less. It's like a, a reduction there. So this list over here basically says that if you've got an input operand that's read i and the, it's being produced from an output operand that is in this list, then it can be forwarded two cycles early. Um, machine model does all this calculation. By the way, I had someone ask me a question once. It's like, oh, I don't think we can use this for JIT. We don't want to be doing all this regex matching and stuff. No, this is TableGen doing all this regex matching to go ahead and come up with these big, huge tables for all this stuff. So a lot of these calculations are all just results of tables. Um, but basically, the latency is going to be two cycles less. Uh, and the same here. So this is uh, the read advance. I wanted to illustrate something I didn't. This is just one. You could actually have a bunch of different forwarding rules. So let's say that these, if you kind of notice, these are all the things that went down on my ALU pipe. So this is pretty easy. It's saying that anything that's in an ALU pipe being produced and then consumed by another instruction can go ahead and be forwarded two cycles early. But if you've got some um, stuff over here, where like this pipe, this is your uh, 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 integer multiply pipe or your MAC pipe, um, one cycle early if it's coming from the ALU pipe. But what I was getting at is you can go ahead and redefine another sketch read advance with another read I that's got a different number and a different list up there. If, for instance, it can be forwarded from a different pipe a cycle early. So it's really, really flexible. Um, and luckily, this is not something you need to do a lot of because generally if you get uh, some documentation, uh, software optimization guide from your architects, they're just going to give you a couple of rules like, oh yeah, anything from this pipe to this pipe, blah, 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 blah. So it's just maybe a half a dozen rules or so. Sometimes the rules are complicated though. Um, sometimes rules for, for forwarding are such that, hey, by the way, if this operand uh, is coming uh, it, it, this operand might not be needed early if there's no shift. So let's say you've got a pipe that does a shift and then the, the ALU operation. Um, it's not two separate micro ops, it's one instruction going down there. So that value coming in, if there's no shift, you don't need the, it nearly as early. So this is things you can't figure out at compile time because you need to know how the instruction is encoded, if there's an actual uh, shift in there or not. So what I did for A53 was I used something called a sketch predicate. A sketch predicate is a way you can attach a little piece of code that executes at compile time that knows how to look into the operands, for instance, or look into any other aspect of that instruction and make some decisions on it. So I came up with this little predicate called uh, red shifted. This basically means, is this register shifted? And uh, the sketch predicate, so it's, a, a, again, a parameterized list. Uh, parameterize a uh, uh, constructor with a list of um, predicates in it, pieces of code, snippets, and that's why you've got the little curly brackets in there. It's basically calling this has shifted register or not, which returns a Boolean. Then I've got this read advance here, and I've got these two separate read advances. Now, like I was saying before, these are, these are named, and this is saying that this is a, anything coming from one of these is going to be one cycle less, or again, two cycles less. So these are two separate. I didn't provide a mapping. I explicitly use sketch read advance, not just read advance. 
So these are like these, these uh, advances, uh, sketch read advances I've got, and I've named them so I can use them later. So this is where the trick finally comes in. Then you have to come up here and you come up with this sketch read variant. So I had a predicate which allows me to pick something, and this is saying that I've got this sketch read variant, and again, I've named it. Oh, this is so confusing, I'm sorry, but and then again, I've named it. So this is not like I provided this mapping. I'm saying, oh, I've got this other thing, a sketch uh, read, and it's a variant. Uh, and it's going to be two options. It's going to be either this option right here, if sketch if red shifted pred is true. Otherwise, it's going to be this option. It's like a, a default value in a switch statement or something. So, OK, great. Now I've got this sketch read thing that is variable, and it uses a predicate to figure out how do we use it. Well, that's when I come in here and I say, OK. Then I alias it. So this is the last you know, interesting thing on this slide. Sorry if you can't see it at the back. But I've got this alias. So this is where the mapping is done. I'm basically saying anything that has a read is reg default sketch read um, annotated on that instruction, uh, use this instead. This is my variant, and it does all this. It's, it's awesome. But this is at compile time. It'll be able to tell you if you've got a shifted value or not. So if it's not shifted, that uh, operand's not needed for two cycles later. That shifted operand's not needed for two cycles later. Um, and, or the second operand that can be shifted. Um, and then you can actually get a mo more accurate idea of how closely you can schedule these things. If this wasn't confusing enough, no, this one's not too bad. Um, I haven't actually used write sequence a lot. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense in the modeling that I've been doing here and showing, because I've been doing all these in-order models. But once you do your first out-of-order model, then everything is, goes from instructions to micro-ops. Um, for the most part, you know, a lot of instructions get mapped to one micro-op. But for instance, that uh, uh, AOU instruction with a shifted operand gets broken into two micro-ops. And they probably go down two separate pipes, and they might not need to feed into the other. But if you do have a sequence where you break something into you know, a dozen micro-ops, and the first you know, three micro-ops form a chain where one feeds into the next, and then the next, and then the next. Um, you need to be able to specify all that, because that sequence has an overall latency. And then you might have another sequence in there that has an overall latency, and then a bunch of other ones. And so you need to figure out the greater of all those to figure out what the actual latency of that write output is going to be. So you do that, and I copied these since we don't have any in A57, these um, sequences, at least none. There probably are sequences, but the documentation I have doesn't um, uh, illustrate it well enough for me. Um, but Cyclone does. So Cyclone has a couple of these write sequences where, again, it's not a, it's, yeah, so this is not a sketch write sequence. This is a write sequence. So this is saying that the write VLD, no, that's weird. Anyhow. I think the, mnemonic, the, the naming convention is slightly broken there. Maybe it's not. It doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, that is not a, uh, 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 that's not a, a mapping per se. It's creating a new write sequence, which is going to be a sketch write uh, type, uh, sketch write res type, and named here. And it's basically saying that this is a list. So these two things have to go back to back. And so the latency would be additive. And then they actually use that to refine several instructions using this instar w, using that regex. Uh, and here's another example here, where they've got basically similar type thing, but it's additive, because that is nine cycles at write VLD. I know because I looked at it was five. Um, and then the, the v4 was four, so it adds to nine. So that's just about as sophisticated as you need. Wow, this is good timing. Sophisticated as you need to get is write sequences. Um, I kind of didn't have a good resource this slide, but they're sprinkled throughout. Uh, thanks for all the reviews. All this stuff took me a while to get reviewed. Uh, a big thanks to Andy. He helped a lot in the reviews and, and, and answered questions for me that I shook my head and said, yes, I got it, and I didn't actually get it. And I read them again months later and said, oh, thanks, Andy. Um, and for just delivering things like you know, post RA scheduler just on time for us. So uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, I open up the floor now to questions. We got another five minutes or so, and I might even slip next door to the uh, hackers lab. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thank you. 
Maybe I missed it, but I did not hear any mention of uh, in itinerary files. Yes, that's and the old legacy way of, um, of so specifying. Th so thank you. So we're doing the same thing, obviously. We're supplying latencies, but it's uh, you know, a different kind of file that's actually, are those deprecated? They just belong to, say, the IR level instruction? Are they at all helpful? So they're not, um, they're not useful if your back end is only using the MI scheduler. However, if you have a back end, if you have a back end um, that has, a, 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 um, uh, it's not using the MI scheduler, or if you have a, a sub-target that you want to start using the MI scheduler for, and that sub-target's already got a bunch of, uh, in, um, a bunch of itineraries, there's something kind of like we had this inst RW. There's something called an itin RW, which allows you to refine all the scheduling information for your instructions and say, by the way, this schedule information for these instructions that match this regex, um, they come from this itinerary. Actually, I think I got it slightly wrong, but the spirit's right. It's a way of taking a bunch of existing itineraries and using the new mach machine scheduler. But that's assuming that you've already got a back end and you've already got a sub-target that's got all these legacy itineraries. So that's about the only involvement that these legacy itineraries have going forward with the machine scheduler, is kind of jump-starting your use of the machine scheduler. Any other questions? You got the mic now, you got to hand it out. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah, if it's nobody, then thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for your question.